Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. My name is Ahmad Salahuddin. I work for International Rice Research Institute in Bangladesh and also associated with the Asian Mega Delta Program. Welcome you all to the Gobeshana Global Conference 4. The session is on Securing the food system of Asian mega deltas for climate and livelihood resilience. We call it Asian mega delta. In short, we uh, use AMD. This program is one of the many other one CGIR programs being implemented by IRI, CIMIT, Worldfish. IMI, CIP, in three most important delta regions of Asia, the Ganges and Brahmaputra Delta, the Mekong Delta, and the Irrawaddy Delta, and their associated countries, which is Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. We will have three presentations in the session. The presentations are based on research activities of the AMD program that deals with nutrition sensitive agri food system in deltas and evidence-based delta development planning. So the first presentation and the last presentation will be uh, on this evidence-based delta development planning. And the second presentation is concerning this nutrition-sensitive agri-food system in deltas. Let me now introduce the presenters and the titles of three very interesting set of presentations for the session. Our first presenter is Ms. Bu Hong Trang. She is an associate scientist, delta management and monitoring evaluation and learning from IRI Vietnam office. She will present a paper on participatory climate smart mapping for adaptation planning. Our second presenter is Mr. Hazrat Ali. He is a senior research, anal research analyst from Wolfish Bangladesh and Wolfish Asia. He will present a paper on mitigation of climate change impacts through integrated aquaculture, agricultural system in Southern Bangladesh. And our last but not the least presenter is Dr. Hamidul Haq. He is a professor in the Institute of Development Studies and Sustainability at in United International University. He will present a paper on water management challenges in coastal polders of Bangladesh, rethinking governance and institutional issues. I'm expecting that we'll uh, use around 75 minutes for the session. Each presenter will have 15 minutes for the presentation. Then we'll be open for the questions and answer session. Then, yeah, the presenters will have enough time to respond to the questions. So I'm expecting about 20, 25 minutes for the session. Participants are requested to please use the chat option to ask your questions or the raise hand function during the question and answer time or throughout the session, whenever you feel so. Without further ado, let me invite our first presenter of this session, Ms. Bu Trang, to present her paper on 
participatory climate smart mapping for adaptation planning. In short, is CS map. Welcome, Chang. Thank you. Your, your time is 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, good day to everyone. My name is Chang. I'm from the International Rice Research Institute. Um, and it is my pleasure to um, be here with you in this session today and discuss about the participatory climate smart mapping of risk and adaptation plans that we are um, did in Bangladesh. Um, so this work has been led by Dr. Bhutan Ian in the International Rice Research Institute, together with the team comprising of Dr. Catherine Nelson, Dr. Samad Amasaluddin, our host today, uh, Mr. Mustafi, Mustafa Ali, Chabarani, um, and Dr. Bjorn Alexander and myself. Um, so this includes um, IRI and our partner in Bangladesh, CEGIS. Um, let me briefly introduce the structure of my presentation today. Um, I would like to first uh, give a very brief introduction of uh, the work that we do under AMD initiative, um, um, besides um, what has been introduced by Dr. Saludin. And then we will dive into some climate um, risk studies in Bangladesh and current gaps that um, have led into the um, work on the participatory mapping approach. And then we'll see some initial outputs and key messages um, from this work. So um, let me briefly introduce again the AMD initiative um, that aims to secure the food systems of Asian mega deltas for climate and livelihood resilience, and as we call the AMD initiative. Um, and so the AMD initiative works on three major deltas of Asia, and um, one of them being the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta in Bangladesh and India. Um, and as, as, as estimated, 53% of the coastal area in this delta um, is affected by salinity intrusion, and um, which damages about 7% of the national rice production. And um, as estimated, um, around 11% to 30% of the area suitable for agriculture will significantly um, decrease due to climate change. Um, therefore, the AMD initiative um, tries to um, uh, tackle the challenges and, um, and support these areas. One of the focus area of the AMD initiative, focus area number five, on evidence-based Delta development planning, tries to provide evidence to support policy dialogue and strategic planning and investment in order to improve the development of climate resilient and inclusive food systems in these deltas. So among the outputs of these focus areas, there will be high resolution climate change risk vulnerability maps um, and climate action plans uh, in order to inform strategic planning and leverage finances for you know, to improve on the food systems in these deltas. Uh, which will uh, contribute to uh, developing cl inclusive climate responsive delta development pathways and also fostering uh, knowledge international networks in this area. Um, so let's look a little bit into climate risk in Bangladesh. Um, as you've seen, um, there have been studies, there have been research done in this topic. And the major risk um, challenging um, food uh, production in Bangladesh include drought, flood, storms, and others. Um, and um, there's been a lot of study done um, to identify the climate risk in Bangladesh and climate risk information is available and accessible from different resources. However, this risk information is quite technical and often not translated properly um, into a, a usable form for targeted users who are farmers, agricultural managers and policy makers in the Delta areas. Um, also, climate risk information um, is very uh, dependent or very specific to the types of crop, the adoption of farming practices and readiness of infrastructure. So without connecting and combining, combining all of this information, it will be challenging to make use of um, the current uh, and available climate risk information. Um, therefore, we have developed and introduced an approach that we call climate smart mapping of risk and adaptation plans 
um, to support the um, mobilization of different information and resources and knowledge into um, a method um, for that will make use of this information for um, the end users. Um, and this method we call CS map um, seeks to reach a common understanding of climate risk for the de de development of adaptation plans. And in order to do that, we seek to answer the questions first. What is the common understanding of climate risk in the area? How do local people define risk levels? What are the potential losses of um, in agricultural production, considering current adoption of farming practices and readiness of infrastructure? Uh, next, what are the feasible adaptation plans um, associated with this risk? And when and where do these uh, actions work well? So in order to answer this question, we will need to adopt a participatory approach to pull together knowledge and um, experience of different stakeholders um, uh, to come up with solutions. And briefly about the process of the CSMAP approach, it comprises of five steps. The first is to identify climate-related risks in the area, uh, next to delineate boundary of risk levels based on technical and local knowledge. Third, to propose corresponding adaptation plans. Fourth, to fine tune and verify these risk maps and adaptation plans with different stakeholders. And finally, to integrate the adaptation plans um, of our individual areas into a larger scale, for example, um, an ecological zone or regional planning. So as you can see throughout the process of this CS map approach, um, it integrates um, scientific findings and local knowledge into one, um, one methodology. And our multi-stakeholder dialogue is the backbone of this process. Um, so um, this is a, an overview of the activities uh, under the CSMAP work that we, um, together with other CC Center and uh, CEGIS, have conducted in Bangladesh. Uh, we first um, sought to find a common understanding of climate risk to a participatory um, approach uh, to find the definition of this risk. And as an example here, you can see uh, some major risks, um, include, uh, including water lodging and drought, um, have been identified for the almond crop in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, the stakeholders have also identified different risk levels um, from no damage, low, moderate, and high levels um, based on the potential damage to production or yield. Uh, to the second step, we um, worked with the stakeholders to map this climate risk into um, the land, um, the planted area of the crop that we have pre, um, previously prepared. Um, and the major risks that were mapped, including uh, water lodging, drought, salinity, for different products based on the areas. So we're working on in Kuna district and Patuakali district. Uh, and we have identified together with the stakeholders, different air crops such as the Aman, Boro, um, else among beans, sunflowers, uh, and different and other crops. Um, we produced the maps for two climate scenarios that we call normal years and extreme years and at the scale of district level. After that, um, we um, prioritize and map adaptation actions um, into the maps of climate risk that we've identified in the previous two steps. Um, criteria used to prioritize adaptation measures um, are first, these measures have to include both structural and non structural measures. Um, they should be feasible and workable in the context of the local area. They should associate with risk levels and scenarios. They should um, be, yeah, be able to be implemented quickly when the risk occurs. And ideally, they should require low operational costs. Um, some examples of adaptation options that were identified for Bangladesh um, include um, actions under categories of crop type, crop variety, structural interventions, policy interventions, and capacity building. And we'll see more specific examples of these adaptation options later. Um, so after, um, after developing these climate risk maps and uh, adaptation maps, um, we went a step further 
to have these maps validated at um, Upazila and Union level um, in Bangladesh. Um, this step, uh, this validation process aimed at understanding uh, more about the community perspective on climate risk and workable adaptation options, um, and to identify grassroots constraints and willingness of male and female farmers in adoption of these adaptation measures. So as you can see, um, this validation process um, tries to empower both female and male farmers in climate planning and decision making. And it also informs planning and uh, planning and strategy development of local and central authorities. Um, during this validation process, we had the present, uh, present representation of people that answered a uh, diversification of geographic location, gender, ethnicity, occupation, and social status. Um, this validation process um, takes a few steps. First, to, um, to, to introduce and um, have our, our local stakeholders, farmers um, at the community level, to have an overview of the CS map outputs that have been um, produced um, during the first um, steps that I introduced. And then um, the farmers were invited to evaluate these maps individually and then in group. Um, and then finally, we wrapped up um, the validation um, and user findings to fine tune the final CS map outputs. This you is four minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is an example of the outputs of the CS map. Initial results um, of um, the process um, show um, the water lodging risk and adaptation plans for the Aman crop in Puna district in the normal years and, uh, and extreme years. So you can see from normal year to extreme years, the level of risk changed from um, low, no risk to low risk or moderate to high risk. And associated with that, there were adaptation options um, introduced, including new water control structure, improvement of irrigation and drainage facility, introduction of new varieties, and least policy change for water bodies. And then after validation with uh, at the community, community level, we were able to fine tune and make the maps more adaptable, more reflective of the um, local capability to adopt these measures. Um, and the final outputs are showing in the screen or still for water watching risks uh, for an adaptation plans for Aman crop in Puna district. And the adaptation measures will focus more on instruction in infrastructure improvements and varieties. Um, we're working with uh, CGIS and other CG Center to further produce these maps for Puna District and um, Patua Kali District. And we hope to be able to transfer um, the entire methodology as well as the set of outputs to our partners in Bangladesh within this year. Um, a few lessons learned that I would like to share with you includes, um, first, um, the definition of um, climate risks are very different among countries and among disciplines and among um, stakeholders. Um, also, these risks and uh, their potential damage uh, depend strongly on the type of crop, biophysical conditions, and readiness of local facilities. Therefore, it is important to pull together the commit, the knowledge, and the experience of different stakeholders to define a common understanding uh, of the risk and uh, the, uh, associated with specific crop season and location. Um, and regarding adaptation measures, stakeholders already have very different uh, effective options to cope with this risk. Um, and therefore, um, their participation is very crucial um, to recommend adapt. outputs of this method, um, it is advised to develop um, farming advisory um, and training on the uh, climate smart agriculture and for and in the long term to develop threat tolerant variety, improve uh, preventative um, facilities and inform policy development. So a few key messages that I'd like uh, to invite you to take out from this presentation today are first, the CSMAP methodology helps to translate technical climate risk data into friendly and ready to use information for farmers and agricultural officers at the local level and national level. And it engages local knowledge and experience. It takes into account the most recent information of crop types, adoption of farming practices and readiness of infrastructure. 
It is useful at various level, farm level, community, upazila, and national level for making decisions on seasonal production planning and adoption of adaptation measures. And finally, the methodology is applicable to different climate um, adaptation projects and at various scales. It's very agile, it's very adaptive, and we look um, very much look forward uh, for potential partnership and collaboration to scale this uh, method further. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Trang, uh, to finish it on time. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some interesting questions coming in after we finish our presentations. Then we can talk about uh, the, the concerns that we have for scaling it up, maybe in, at the national levels. And Thank also you. maybe we can talk about a little bit of the cross-country learning because this being implemented in three different countries. So yes. maybe that would be also something to discuss uh, as an interesting point. Thank you. All right. So can I now invite our second presenter, Mr. Hazrutar. He's a senior research analyst in the World Fish Bangladesh and World Fish Asia. His paper is uh, mitigation of climate change impacts through integrated aquaculture, agricultural system in Southern Bangladesh. The floor is yours, Mr. Hazrat Ali. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Hazrat Ali from World Fish Bangladesh and uh, I'm uh, for the for this session, my presentation my title is uh, mitigation of climate change impacts through integrated aquaculture agriculture interventions in southern Bangladesh. And uh, you know, or, you know, in nutrition sensitive agriculture my, my agriculture programs are designed to address the. Can you put uh, it in a presentation mode, please? Sorry, already in presentation mode. However. I'm trying to from, from the first again. It's not coming yet, but you can continue, perhaps. Is, is it okay now? Not yet, but uh, you can continue. We can see the slides. Please continue because uh, yeah, some technical problem. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, sorry for the interrupt. <laughs> The, how about the malnutrition? Uh, malnutrition is also per, exist in uh, even after green evaluation of uh, agricultural production in um, uh, Bangladesh, and that's uh, the key. Uh, sorry, uh, it's a slide not short. This is not looks good. I think. Maybe you can go back and but, yeah. Oh, no, fine. Okay. Yes. Is, is it okay now? Yes, 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 yes fine. I, I, I'm starting from the beginning. Sorry for the interrupt. Uh, so, uh, today's my uh, presentation title is um, uh, in Mitigation of Climate Change Impact uh, uh, Integrated Aquaculture and Agriculture Intervention in Southern Bangladesh. And uh, uh, all, all you know, the nutrition-sensitive agriculture and uh, intervention program to address the uh, underlying causes of malnutrition and uh, for the inter incorporate specific uh, nutrition goals. However, the, there is a triple burden of malnutrition uh, exist even after green um, uh, revolution of agricultural production. And the key component of this nutrition-sensitive agriculture is crop diversification, which actually improve the diets and um, nutrition for the human uh, health. 
and the integrated aquaculture agriculture is the, uh, is a common form of uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture where um, uh, aquatic and terrestrial crops um, are um, uh, grown together in the same plot and the integrated aquaculture agriculture is a common practice in bangladesh however there is a very uh, limited research on the whether those uh, practices improve the um, uh, productivity of uh, uh, micronutrients and that's why this our research um, um, hypothesis was the what is the nutritional and the economic productivity of a different integrated farming system in southern Bangladesh. Uh, this um, study actually uh, funded by uh, Fish Innovation Lab through USAID and uh, data for this study was collected um, uh, between December 2020 and January 21. And the total amount of uh, food um, uh, produced and the value of those fruits um, from the sample ponds are collected through extractor um, questionnaire interview. And we also use uh, Bangladesh food composition tables uh, to analyze the nutritional outcome. We, uh, we surveyed, um, uh, surveyed um, uh, 721 households and uh, those households are categorized four categories based on the aquatic food produced, like only fish, fish and prawn, fish and shrimp, fish and um, fish, prawn and shrimp. And uh, the result shows that 44% of the um, households um, are um, practicing the households practicing integrated, um, uh, integrated their sample prawn with the fish, and um, uh, agricultural crops like um, uh, vegetables, fruits, and um, or rice are all together. And um, uh, most of common um, uh, integration was found in the fish and corn farming systems uh, compared to the other uh, other practices. And um, the households, the figure shows the households um, uh, producing integrated, non-integrated form of aquaculture. Uh, actually produced um, uh, lowest amount of total food per hectare. Um, um, however, some of them uh, have also produced highest aquatic foods. But the overall and the overall share of the um, share of the aquatic food sold is um, uh, is, is um, highest. It's a uh, 71 percent compared to the others um, um, other food uh, crops like vegetables and fruits. Is 57 percent and um, rice 53 percent. And this um, uh, figure actually shows the economic productivity by, uh, by each of the crop produced and by farming uh, systems. And um, uh, this uh, figure shows that um, uh, with, um, uh, the integration with, um, uh, with um, uh, fish, prawns, and rice, vegetables, and fruits, and integration with uh, fish, prawns, and shrimp, and rice, vegetables, and fruits is our um, most profitable intervention, whereas um, the Integration with the fish and rice and fish and rice, fruits and vegetables are less profitable. And in comparison with the economic productivity and nutrition productivity, this figure indicates that the nutrition productivity of the farming systems is partly disconnected from their economic productivity. And the economic productive uh, and uh, the um, uh, integrated systems uh, that um, uh, combined uh, fish um, uh, fish prawns and uh, rice vegetables and uh, fruits uh, uh, fruits uh, is one of the most um, uh, profitable um, uh, most profitable economically profitable food combinations uh, and um, this system also produced uh, uh, highest amount of micronutrients and the economic um, uh, productivity of non-integrated shrimp farms uh, um, uh, in the figure shows the economic product of non-integrated shrimp farm is close to the sample average, but those systems have uh, produced uh, much lower than average um, uh, quantity of uh, micronutrients per hectare. So this indicates that this indicates that so the um, uh, this um, uh, there is a um, uh, positive correlation between the productivity of terrestrial um, uh, Foods into aquatic food, aquatic farming systems and nutrition productivity. 
Uh, for the core, uh, core regression analysis, we subdivided aquatic foods into four categories and terrestrial crops into eight categories to assess the um, uh, relationship between the food production and economic productivity and nutrition productivity. And the regression shows a positive and significantly correlation between the um, production of aquatic uh, food, um, foods and the gross margin higher. Um, crustaceans productions have the largest impact on the um, uh, on gross margin uh, compared to the crops and other um, aquatic uh, foods. And um, also the, the production of uh, vegetables and um, nut oil seed um, has a positively and um, significantly correlated with the um, uh, gross margin. We also um, um, disaggregated those um, uh, those food into um, uh, each of the um, uh, groups and uh, for the um, assess the relationship between the um, uh, production uh, production and micro uh, micro micro nutrient. And um, uh, we found that and for the unstock species, um, uh, the mola and the tangra species are particularly significant um, uh, source of micronutrients. Uh, this result indicates that the southern importance of the southern regions um, uh, aquatic biodiversity for supplying um, uh, micro uh, supporting human nutrition. The, um, and this um, uh, correlation, um, the regression analysis um, actually um, uh, shows the overall regression. So the overall um, uh, results suggest that the uh, aquatic foods are economically and nutritionally uh, productive, but uh, terrestrial foods uh, play a significant role for the supplying uh, human nutrition. As, a, as a, in, in a summary, we can conclude that the production of a specific combination of aquatic foods and vegetables can simultaneously improve the nutrition productivity and economic productivity. That's why integrated aquaculture agriculture intervention could be promoted in the southern regions as a nutrition sensitive agriculture interventions. However, the increasing the productivity, um, um, increasing the increasing the diverse productivity diversity is not always the effective path to improve diversity. As um, increase the income is another important aspect to uh, increase the diversity, especially in the uh, salinity affected um, area. So the integrated um, uh, agriculture and eco uh, aquaculture, the integrated aquaculture and agriculture can um, mitigate the uh, could be making the climate's impact um, as as uh, these uh, systems uh, provide a diversification of income and food sources, which uh, make the um, uh, farmer less vulnerable to the extreme uh, extreme some uh, weather events like uh, cyclones or floods or droughts. Even these systems also um, can improve. Uh, food security by providing the diversified and resilient source of food and income, which reduce the farmer less vulnerable on the single food sources, which may be affected by the climate change. Also, this, this indicator systems uh, allow to, uh, to use efficient use of waters, where the nutrient-rich water from the pond could be used to irrigate crops, which actually reduce the dependency of the freshwater sources and helping farmer to mitigate the impact of droughts and water scarcity, um, which is created mainly by the climate, uh, climate change. And nutrient rich water from the pond could be used to the, could be used in the irrigation, irrigation which actually uh, reduce the need for synthetic fertilizer and pesticide, which uh, is a, which is a significant sources of uh, greenhouse emissions in a, in, a, in a future our future plan is to identify and promote a specific crop combination that maximize economic and nutrition productivity at a different level of salinity in the southern bangladesh our this work is funded by uh, the future fish innovation lab so we highly acknowledge them and also this is a part of the cgr initiative on the asian mega delta uh, to continue the res those research work. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for finishing your presentation on time. Uh,
uh, and this is a very interesting area where we can show that how different in uh, institutes can contribute towards a common objective of you know increasing resilience in the coastal areas uh, deltas uh, so uh, thank you very much. And I saw already that some people uh, asked you to share the presentation. So maybe uh, they found it very interesting already. So we are expecting some questions after we finish the third paper. Can I now um, invite our third presenter, Dr. Hamidul Haq, the professor of Institute of Development Studies and Sustainability at the United International University. He will present the paper on water management challenges in coastal folders of Bangladesh, rethinking governance and institutional issues. So yeah, uh, Laila already put the presentation. You can now proceed, Dr. Hamid Lahab. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed Salahuddin and Laila for helping. And you know, we are a team of uh, researchers, uh, Dr. Ahmed Salahuddin, Salma Begum from IDSS, and myself. Uh, we were taking the opportunity of conducting research under uh, Asia. And uh, we started the study uh, from the third quarter of last year, uh, from literature review to uh, primary collection from the two. And still, we are not finished with the study process. But so far, we earned the knowledge from the primary stakeholders and other stakeholders. Okay, I take this advantage on behalf of my research team uh, to share it. And you know, Gabeshana is a platform to, uh, learn, to share and learn uh, the innovations, especially focusing on uh, climate change adaptation in all the world. And today, I recall the memories of Dr. And we all uh, had opportunity to work with Gabeshana. We will we'll follow his sales uh, that Can you can you please uh, keep your microphone close? Yeah, uh, but little louder, yes. please. Yeah, am I am I now uh, audible? It's yes. better. Okay, thank you. So, coastal zone uh, of all the deltas are highly potentials, but uh, allowing vulnerabilities. So Bangladesh coastal zone is not uh, free from the vulnerabilities and uh, potentials or opportunities. So these opportunities are uh, mobilized through uh, interventions of different type of projects as we are listening to World Fish presentation and run. And this uh, uh, pre presentation is based on Another uh, uh, large scale project uh, implemented by Bangladesh Water Development Board, which is popularly known as Blue Gold. So we try to make our uh, water as a product of gold. But the water system in coastal zone is known as a very complex system because it is. Uh, influenced by the tidal water system or tidal river system. And saline, saline water intrusion is a big problem, which is uh, uh, increased by the cyclonic uh, storm surge uh, often. And to manage these uh, complexities, uh, there was a planned interventions in the coastal zone in uh, early 60s, uh, which is known as polderization of the coastal zone. Polder is a uh, popular Dutch uh, 
uh, engineering concept. It is uh, embankment, but along the riverside in a uh, circle way, but in a wrong uh, ring way. So that is why we uh, call uh, the, this uh, engineering work as a polderize. The polderization was done to protect the coastal floodplains uh, from the uh, regular tidal uh, surge, uh, as well as from storm surge. And at the same time, also protected from uh, saline water intrusion so that we can grow uh, crops. And historically, it is uh, acknowledged that first 10 years of uh, polderization was a golden time for the farmers of coastal zone because they could uh, grow at least three crops a year. And also freshwater availability was dominant. And freshwater water, uh, uh, fish was highly available. Altogether, the uh, period of uh, first decades after polderization was a golden period as popular it is now. But uh, over the period, for different reasons, uh, water management became very challenging. That's why our research was to uh, explore the possible options to uh, uh, develop some uh, approaches, uh, including some policy guidelines towards ensuring the good governance uh, in water resources management in the polders or in the polarized areas. And uh, uh, historically, it is known that uh, all the water sector projects were uh, following a common uh, approach of managing water during uh, a project implementation uh, by forming water users groups, water users association groups in a uh, you know small scale, and association is the combination of all the water users uh, groups. During, from the uh, literature as well as from experience, it is uh, known that the uh, functions of water users, groups, and associations during the project period was uh, uh, acknowledged as very effective uh, functions. But uh, our, from the literature and also from our own uh, recent study, it is explored or it is known that the uh, functions of water users groups and water users associations are not up to the level of expectations, rather in many cases very uh, frustrating. Uh, but the uh, conceptual approaches were uh, followed, which are popularly known as effective, like participatory water resource management, uh, bottom-up approach to water resource management and uh, very uh, uh, planned way engaging the farmers and also uh, other stakeholders in the uh, water uh, uses processes. But the project uh, supported all these activities of these uh, water users uh, groups but beyond the project, because of uh, lack of uh, funding and also human resources, it, uh, it lacks, meaning there is no uh, inputs provided uh, in the processes of activities of the uh, water users groups and processes. So our uh, study uh, took place in uh, two areas. One is in uh, Kulna, uh, Folder 34 by 2, and another one is Potuakali, uh, Folder uh, 43 by 2M. Uh, 
so these because there are so many uh, polders constructed and all the polders are known uh, by their uh, numbers that is uh, put by the so our uh, research followed some uh, methods and techniques and also used various types of tools, uh, to collect uh, data so we conducted uh, individual uh, interviews of the water users groups leaders members then group discussions with them then focus group discussion with them and also uh, discussions with the uh, local government uh, institutions like the union commission and uh, we'll have also another round of discussions with different government to share uh, the findings so far we, we have had and also to have some new uh, inputs from them in order to uh, improve the water governance system. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, okay, I, I don't want to give all these uh, you know, specific numbers of how many But uh, uh, I, I would like to share the findings uh, from both. Uh, findings uh, are like uh, it is common to both the folder that the water users, groups, and associations were very much uh, happy uh, with their uh, uh, old responsibilities, activities and the effectiveness of their uh, activities during the project period. And uh, the management of water resources were quite uh, satisfactory and which were very much uh, connected to the uh, crop production. As our previous two presentations um, showed, uh, water availability and uh, efficiently manage the water supply system is highly uh, potential and relevant to the crop uh, production including the crop calendar uh, because the cropping pattern depends on the seasonality as well as uh, crop types varieties and also the new innovations uh, because uh, uh, historically in the past only paddy was the dominant uh, crop now crop varieties as well as uh, cropping system got changed uh, with the uh, introduction of new technologies as well as uh, adaptation to the uh, new phenomena especially the climatic uh, uh, because uh, in last uh, syndicates, the uh, changes uh, in weather uh, and the frequency of cyclonic storms and also drought and also salinization is. So water management uh, approaches uh, got changed because from surface water uh, to groundwater dependency is but farmers love to have the efficient supply of uh, surface water uh, for different uh, types of agriculture. Uh, then the uh, findings show the stakeholders of uh, different uh, sectors like uh, agriculture sector, water uh, sector, business sector, uh, are very much uh, closely connected to uh, water users. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, expected supports and services, uh, including uh, the presence of uh, different stakeholders, uh, varied. And uh, we tried to have a, a mapping of these 
uh, closeness as well as uh, absence or distances of different stakeholders with uh, water users. And the uh, mapping showed the water users groups are closely, um, uh, they, they find the local government, especially the Union Purishad is very close to them in, in, in terms of different activities. Uh, but uh, they, are, they are not uh, designated organization to support uh, water uh, management in relation to agriculture. But uh, agricultural extension, Department of Agricultural Extension, is uh, very close to water users groups in terms of water uses uh, in relation to agriculture. But uh, within the policy framework, the institutional arrangement showed Bangladesh Water Development Board is the authority to officially deal with the water users groups and association. Because uh, under the policy guidelines, they formed these groups during the project uh, implementation period, and they are also uh, officially uh, engaged to work with these water users groups in the processes of uh, water resources management in the side of the But agriculture extension uh, department uh, is closely uh, uh, working with the farmers in relation to uh, training, uh, advising, uh, providing uh, them with uh, services of different uh, kinds and forms. And uh, they have their uh, field staff, uh, from field staff to office level staff are often uh, connected. Uh, in person or uh, through other means of communication uh, with the farmers. Uh, Can you farm finish in two minutes, please? Yes, right. These farmers are the uh, members of water users groups. Uh, that's why uh, the farmers and the water users groups and associations are uh, very much uh, closely connected with the uh, Department of Agricultural Extension in the uh, in the field of water resource management for agriculture but by policy framework the department of agricultural extension uh, is not uh, the designated uh, organizations or uh, work with the water industry so the sort of uh, uh, options uh, where uh, suggested by the farmers, water users, groups, and local level uh, stakeholders that uh, if the Department of Agriculture and Extension uh, is given the mandate to work with the uh, water users groups, then they, uh, this, uh, both parties may work uh, closely and uh, uh, have uh, the services, supports, and all the possible information available in the field level uh, in the processes of uh, efficient uses of water for agriculture. And, uh, but the Department of uh, Agriculture Extension, Water Development Board, Fisheries, and uh, Forestry, they must maintain coordination and communication uh, in relation to uses of water in the uh, folders, uh, giving the leading uh, responsibility to the water users groups and association. That may uh, address the challenges of current uh, complex water users management towards a sustainable solution. That could be the institutional arrangement of water users folders. So that was our uh, finding. And uh, come up with a final report and some official uh, documents after having the study completed. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Harbindil Haq. Uh, it's a very interesting paper presentation. Uh, I think we can now go for a uh, question and answer you are, session. You are, uh, you are muted somehow. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, whoever is interested to ask a yeah. question, please go ahead. Uh, use your you open your camera and and also the microphone and ask the question. Please introduce yourself first and then, yes, Mike. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I don't have the means to open my camera, I'm afraid. I can't see a button. Maybe you can introduce yourself, your organization. Certainly. My name is Mike Akester. I work for World Fish. I'm the regional director, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. I am based in uh, Myanmar and live in Yangon. And I have a comment and question for all three presentations, which were very useful. Thank you. I uh, note that Ahmed Salahuddin's presentation about polders and the use of uh, participatory use of or improved use of water is, of course, very important. Trang's presentation about mapping helps visualize the vulnerability of certain areas to climate change. And Hazrat Ali's very interesting paper about the cost benefit of different production systems, integrated agriculture, aqu aquaculture. Also interesting. My my comment is relates to the uh, a piece of work which took place some time ago. The so-called Daud Kandi model, and I put a link in the in the chat. It looks at a polarized system which seasonally fills up with water, and therefore the rice production area is flooded. And fish are stocked and managed in a, a in a cooperative way to add benefit to the landowners. It's an interesting model, and I just wondered how many people have are aware of it, and whether or not it is still considered to be a successful model. Thank you. Over. Yes, Mike. I I know about that model, and I had a plan to visit. I know. Uh, the main, um, you know, organizer and the agency concerned. But I think the situation is a little bit different compared to the coastal areas. It's a little inside the country, although maybe inside a polder. So uh, as a, you know, for uh, community-based, organized, large scale, uh, uh, fisheries projects is very interesting for all of us to learn. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Hajrat Ali wants to comment anything on that. Hajrat Ali, you want to respond to this question? Actually, the community based uh, fisheries management, right? That's on white grid. Yes. But a, a specific example is in Bangladesh in the in a different part as I know. Uh, this uh, community waste is um, uh, depend on the community perspective and the resource. In Southern Belt, that's uh, that this um, uh, management and the community uh, water body in the other part of the country is little bit different. So um, uh, so here management and other part is a little bit different, Mike. So yeah. We can we can see this one if you uh, give Mike give the link and we can we can check that one as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other question? Yeah, may I uh, ask uh, Sal a very uh, small question? Please. But, uh, this uh, CS map, uh, is it uh, renewable every year or because climate variables may uh, disrupt uh, seasonality sometime 
uh, there is no uh, forecast of uh, you know rainfall suddenly rainfall is there. there is no forecast of drought suddenly no rain there is a drought so be, because if the uh, technical advices are given following the cs map and farmers want to follow but in between there is a gap so uh, how do you uh, keep the provision of bringing changes and what should be the basis of these changes in the map? Thank you for the question. I would like to answer up to my understanding of the CS map approach. Um, so the CS map is um is designed to reflect uh, different scenarios, including normal years and extreme years. Um, in both years, the risk um, occurs. However, um, when it occurs, um, it is expected to have different levels of damage to our uh, food production. So um, with very high damage, it can be considered a reference year for extreme years. And uh, with medium or um, moderate damage, for example, it could be considered a reference for normal year. Um, so with a set of maps for normal years and extreme years, it is expected that um, when um, for example, this year when a, a risk occurs, then maybe um, the communities or the um, officials can refer to either of the scenarios um, and then they will have a reference for adaptation plans that can be applied um, when um, to the extent of um, the level of risk that, um, that they are observing uh, in the area. Uh, of course, it will be very helpful if the maps are updated frequently. Uh, to uh, accommodate the changes in the climate conditions, um, as well as the changes in the local context, including infrastructural um, and uh, planting um, uh, planting duration and, and all the farming practices um, that change in the area. So um, it is up to the local authorities or the community um, if they want to update these maps um, as frequently as resources allow or as frequently as they find important um, and um, the, the methodology uh, will be transferred to our partners in Bangladesh. So um, it is up to, to their will and available resources to update these maps um, as they find fit. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Salaudi, may I make a small comment on Mike's comment? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, Mr. Mike, uh, you uh, referred to the Outcountry module, is it? Uh, under the Meghna Donaguna project? Aladdin Bhai, you can also. I uh, think this is the large, large uh, uh, scale project, which is known as Meghna Donaguna. Right, no, the, the I, have, I haven't got the, the details, but the, the paper is in the chat and it describes the actual area, so. But anyway, conceptually, this uh, community-based uh, water resource management uh, under the uh, large projects or big project is absent. So uh, by project policy, it is uh, admitted and it is taken up. But in practice, it is uh, rather uh, the experts' uh, suggestions, experts, experts suggested community-based management, meaning community has no authority of uh, putting options for a decision, but they do follow. So far, the project team, uh, you know, uh, make the suggestions or ideas, options available in the project. And that is why during the project implementation, the community participation apparently seems very active and effective. Uh, in the project evaluation process, we find that. But in the post-project period, uh, when we want to see the continuation of that knowledge-based practice is there, and it is working rather in an increasing amount of, uh, or increasingly efficient, uh, it doesn't uh, you know, happen. Our uh, other uh, studies also explored this kind of uh, you know, uh, experience. Uh, but to me, uh, this is from my own work and uh, experience, the 
un, until unless the authority is not given to the community over the resources, then community-based uh, water resource management uh, is not possible. That, that is my point. Okay, thank you. There thank, may be thank, debates, but uh, this is my question. Yes, thank you very much. And there's a link there with territorial I, use. I have, uh, for Dr. Hamid al -Hawk, I actually have a good uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Mor Mr. Morshed, who is actually leading this community-based fisheries, who is, uh, which is actually a people's organization now. So this is not under any project anymore. This is the community itself on the an organization through which they operate this. So it's more that is in, sustainable. Uh, in that can, that is in yes. yes, yes. It's totally different story. Uh, so I may and you have a question. Can you please ask it in the, the microphone? For all the panelists. Oh, please give the microphone access for me and Habib, can you please help? Can we hear you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh she asked me to read it. So for all the panelists, she asked that, have we seen the salinity intrusion on site? I wonder how saline water can pass through the polders, which is controlled by a sluice gate. Also from communities consultation, water logging was identified as the major risk and not salinity intrusion. Anybody wants to respond among the panelists? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, in the polder, there are uh, different kinds of agricultural activities, uh, and, uh, which requires saline water. For example, uh, if, we, if uh, big farmers or large farmers want to go for uh, shrimp cultivation, pack the uh, variety. It needs uh, saline water. So they, uh, uh, from the uh, observations of the local farmers or people, uh, they bring uh, saline water using uh, some technology unofficially or illegally. But no one can uh, prevent this. Uh, and though they bring their own land, but it uh, get leaked to the neighboring uh, plots. So that is one of the problems. During the cyclone, uh, you know, uh, disaster, sometimes the uh, embankments or the dike uh, get uh, broken and then uh, water comes in uh, uh, full of uh, saline water and it gets spread it all over the land. And to dewater in it, it takes longer time. And uh, during uh, uh, the uh, sluice gates are uh, you know, closed, but it is not that much efficient can protect the hundred uh, percent, you know, leakage of saline water. And over the weeks or years, so a good amount of water enter into the uh, field. Because of lack of freshwater intrusion or available freshwater, so the renewal of uh, saline water from the soil doesn't uh, get this. So that uh, does cause salinization in the crop or water and the soil. That is from my uh, you know, general knowledge. Which comes from the yeah, I think that we we cannot expect a perfect uh, 
uh, operation of all the sluice gates and all the pool dates in terms of technicality and also in terms of management. That's why sometimes it happens. So, uh, if the if both are in uh, good condition, I think we can avoid the intrusion of saline water without the will of, of the community. So any other question? Can I also respond this one? Yes, Sorry. Can I add something with uh, Dr. Hamidu, Hamidul? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. the salinity is, is definitely sometimes what about the my last visit in the Sampolar area and uh, the uh, the community people basically they may raise the issue through the you know uh, some salinity water some, uh, enter into the um, uh, their area due to the um, uh, hole uh, made by the crab and other things. That's why also in, uh, enter the salinity water. Even in the groundwater of that, the boulder also have the um, uh, level of salinity. So uh, we cannot control the salinity at that cases. And uh, also there is the water logging. Definitely it's uh, depend on the, um, uh, the community. In a, in a, within a boulder, it is a large area. So have some uh, you know, lowland, uh, highland, so different level of land. If uh, we want water for the you know, high land area, then my, my low land area definitely it will be the water logging problem. That's a happening when we visit the last visit with the AMD team in the in the Pudokali resorts. So we found this in different um, concentration group, we found the, um, these types of uh, issues. And the low land area, there are always the water logged, and but upper land, upper land area people, they didn't get any water. That's the that's the problem. So, is a specific community level that types of problem also have. Thank you. All right. Uh, do you have any more question? If not, we can just close the session. I think uh, Nafis, you wanted to add something. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Nafis from ICAT. Um, I had a question. The yes. question is, uh, uh, I have written in the chat box, uh, that is withdrawal of water in the uh, upstream by Farakka barrage that is done by the Ganges Treaty. And it poses a significant threat to Bangladesh. That is the uh, dry season water unavailability. So uh, the Ganges Treaty is going to end at 2026. And I don't know whether or not it is going to renew or not. So what, what is the role or what how we can play some role, especially the government institutions or the integration, uh, how government institution can be integrated, can work in an integrated way to renew the Ganges Treaty and uh, the problems, we can show the problems of our uh, during the dry season that we don't get enough water. We can show sufficiently uh, to, the, to India that we need more water during the dry season. So how we can play a role, especially the government institution, how we can integrate between us, among us, and how we can send the message to India that uh, we need this treaty to be more sufficiently to be rethink that we need more water. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very big and good question, but maybe a little beyond this uh, purview of this uh, webinar. But if any one of our panelists wants to respond uh, for one minute, it's fine. Yeah, uh, Nafis, I think uh, since I can see you are a student of UF or you are graduated uh, from UF, here were uh, some works from UF. From different uh, departments or and also you know this uh, transboundary uh, commission we have uh, so in, in in policy level both governments are trying to address the water sharing issue but not happening much uh, good result that is uh, the frustration of West Bengal and uh, Bangladesh because uh, Amta Banerjee said, we can uh, share our water with you until we are uh, having sufficient water. Uh, but transboundary river uh, water sharing issues is all over the world in all the deltas. And the government is still working, but not very much uh, you know, uh, effective result. But there were some proposals of 
uh, preserving or retaining the flood water here in Monsoon Province. We have over water in the country. And those projects are not taking place. If those projects are uh, implemented, perhaps your uh, no concern will be addressed. That, uh, because it is the uh, you know, natural way of dealing with the uh, you know, resource. Like when we do have uh, enough resource, we can save it. And then we can use it uh, when we, we have less uh, resource. I think in water, river water management, it is one of the best options. Popularly accepted, technically accepted, but politically it is not yet. Thank you, Dr. Hamidul Haq. I think we should close this uh, question and answer session. And uh, as a moderator, I can now thank all the presenters for their contribution and all the participants uh for their uh, patient sharing and also asking questions uh, we have so far heard three papers one was from miss Hu hong trang on participatory climate smart mapping for adaptation planning that offers potential for effective use in deltas uh from Vietnam office, but she was telling the story of Bangladesh uh, uh, study. I think the main challenge for us now to uh, take this as a good case uh, in terms of promoting and scaling it up so that we can ensure that it is being used, updated and scaled up in the system. Thank you for this uh, contribution, uh, Vu. The second paper was uh, presented by Mr. Hajrut Ali on mitigation of climate change impacts through integrated agricultural, agricultural system in Southern Bangladesh. The paper was based on a recent study conducted in the Southwest of Bangladesh. Uh, and very interestingly, this cross cuts uh, climate change issues, nutrition, and food uh, availability and efficiency. So it's a very important one that will actually justify that how, what is the importance of, you know, working together across uh, CG institutes as well. And we have to look for uh, our counterpart organizations so that we can also uh, take this forward in terms of intensifying our evidences and we make use of those evidences for policy uh, formulation. And the last paper was presented by uh, Professor Dr. Hamid al -Hawk on water management challenges in coastal polders of Bangladesh, rethinking governance and institutional issues. This is a very interesting study that we did not actually finish it yet. We have a component of, you know, uh, doing some policy advocacies across the policy ladders. So <coughs> we just finished the FGDs with uh, water management groups and associations and union Porishad. Uh, now we'll approach to, you know, Upuzela Porishad where we'll be you know, presenting our findings and then uh, take forward the recommendation to the district level and also to the national level. Once we can do that, uh, then perhaps we'll come out with a you know, set of recommendations, policy recommendations that will help us to outline uh, some institutional changes to bring you know, good governance in the water management system in coastal areas. So I, I hope that uh, this has a potential to bring some you know, effective policy changes that ultimately uh, help uh, the whole of coastal water management in polders that uh, indirectly will also help the other components of the program, like developing, you know, effective technologies, 
and also experimenting all those cross cutting issues uh, for you know impactful uh, research and development so thank you everybody can, can we take a picture of if all uh, show yes. up so uh, okay maybe we can request and... all to open their cameras uh, for a moment and then we can take the picture and then we finish yeah maybe uh Lila, Cameron, you can take a picture of one of his or Fatim. can you all open your cameras please uh, Habib, can you please take a screenshot for us? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, Fatih. Mike, you didn't open your camera yet. I Wait. don't know how to. No, my mic has no. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, Nafis, 